Good morning, Burbs. My name is Azalera, and welcome to the seventh episode of Oracle Connection Podcast. And as you may or may not have known, I have a very special guest today in Mr. Nathan, who is actually the original first community manager of PSO2 Global since the launch of it. Hi, Nathan. What's up? Hello there, Arcs. It's uh, it's good to say, hey there, Arcs, again. <laughs> it's something that I, I kind of miss it. Uh... Every day would just start whenever I had an announcement or anything like that saying ARC. So it's great to be back talking PS2 and talking to you guys. It's definitely been quite a good while ever since you actually got it back into this space because, I mean, having, having been in here for like what? at least over a good year of your life just working on PSO2, 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 PSO2. It's like, it's almost in your blood at this point. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. It, it was a definitely a stepping stone in my career uh, in gaming. And it's also interesting because it's one of the first things that I ever did after moving to America. So I'm not originally from here. Uh, so one of the first endeavors I had into the gaming industry for sure. Uh, you say that like a year, year and a half, but to me it felt like 10 years sometimes. <laughs> really? Uh, but yeah, but looking back, maybe... Maybe sometimes it, it feels like it, it went by really fast, um, just based on the amount of stuff we always had to do. I would imagine as like a community manager, right? You'd always have to really think about like everything that's going on. You have to <laughs> always be fed like the news and like, hey, there's this happening, there's that happening. And it's just like information after information after information. And I, I can imagine it's super overwhelming. Yeah, so, um, so players have very few avenues in which they understand what goes behind community management and a lot of people uh comment on twitter and there's always that that one comment is like oh this twitter intern did, did this and just to clarify and start this podcast i just want to say no brand in the entire world <laughs> would allow an intern or an un- or un- untrained person to represent their brand <laughs> on Twitter or social, that's that's the most public facing avenue you have. Um, so I don't believe uh, there are companies out there just employing interns for that capacity, <laughs> especially when it comes to creating content. So. Although since you are the former community manager right now, so basically like Nathan is not working on the PSO2 Twitter anymore, uh, what's been going on with you recently? Yeah, so uh, I left the PSO2 project uh, around July this year, and I became a senior community manager for a company called Hidden Leaf Games. Uh, It's always been my goal or aspiration to work in the indie industry, is what I'm passionate about. Uh, And I saw this opportunity to build a community from the ground up and uh, get a game in its inception at a startup, and I thought it was amazing. Uh, especially because when you're a startup, not only you have the autonomy to to really make a difference, but you're also kind of seeing all facets of game development. So even though I'm in community, you know, you can leave your input in character design and heroes and, and concept art and uh, just development in general. And it's it's been great. It's been a lot of fun. And uh, at one point, I, I do have to thank PSOG for that because it opened a lot of doors for me in that sense. And then having just like the whole Sega name also, just like, hey man, I I worked at Sega before. And it's just like, yeah, that that's big. Everyone knows the name. Yeah, but in, interesting enough, uh, there's something that I always shared on my tweets, uh, on my personal account, is that I worked for Sega or I worked with Sega, but I didn't work at Sega. So that's, that's the interesting dynamic of the ps 2 project which is we were partners working directly with sega of japan mm. when ps 2 uh came uh, to north america and eventually became ps 2 global so uh i was working at a company called est soft which is actually a korean company oh and yes so so we got uh the account and i don't know the specifics about how we came to to like actually work with PSO2 and with Sega Japan. But uh, what happened is there were whispers in the office about it. And uh, I knew it was Fans Star Online 2 because it's kind of the only title that we could possibly do. Uh, we do live service games. Right. So so I heard the name Sega of Japan and then I started speculating. 
And then I immediately, you know, went to the project director at the time. I was like, hey, whatever you guys are doing with Sega, I have to be involved. And uh, one thing led to another. And then I ended up um, becoming part of the team. And I I was all in. And I'm not going to get into specifics, but I did my work well. And I ended up getting promoted and had the opportunity to uh, build the team from the ground up. So... It was four of us, pretty much, and a huge office space. And our goal was, you know, assemble a team, uh, each uh, each person with its department, and and uh, you know, from the ground up, get the publishing operations for PSO2 going. This behemoth title <laughs> that is long awaited, that people have been waiting for for so many years, and you know, uh, we have this set amount of time. To, to launch it and it was such a fun and tremendous experience that beginning and and setting everything up and you know getting familiarized with the title and you know playing in <laughs> in JP I can say that now I played a lot in JP <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah it was just fantastic uh, thank you Sega for the opportunity and it was just a great time Right. But yeah, I I didn't work a Sega. I worked for Sega of Japan directly, which is was the, probably the most interesting thing that I did so far. Yeah. As as you were saying, right? You basically started off working on PSO2 Global as the head of community, right? Yes, that is correct. And then when you when you were saying about like, yeah, so I've been hearing about like live service and a work from Sega of Japan and stuff like that. Did you actually did you actually expect a PSO2 Western release in 2020 after eight years of the release of the game? So there's a, that's a fun story. Uh, so back in Brazil, since college, I have this ritual that whatever is happening, if I have class or now if I have work, whenever E3 is happening. I'll take the time off and I'll make a whole holiday out of it. I'll invite my friends over, we'll make popcorn and do all the things and watch the event together. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's a very common thing for us to do. Um, but it was my first or second year in America. It was just me, but I still like, I'm going to take the time and watch it. Uh, and I actually got to, to go to E3 that year. It was actually the last E3 event that happened in person before COVID. Oh, before okay. Yeah, so I, I was on the showroom. It was it was amazing. It was a great time of my life. But the the big thing is, I I was already hearing a lot of rumors about uh, whether we're gonna work on PSO2 or not, or whether we're gonna work on this you know project with Sega. Um, my superiors definitely knew it, but I I, I just had r- rumors at the time, and I I, I was already in consideration because I asked to be involved and i watched the the fantasy starline 2 trailer in the microsoft uh conference and i was freaking out like the rest of of you guys (laughs) pretty pretty much because like okay i have to like this was a e3 moment phil spencer on the stage announcing fantasy starline 2 uh i feel like a lot of people in the audience that didn't know what was happening was like it went right over their heads, but for the people that knew exactly what PS2 was and have been waiting for all the time, it was like mind blowing. So that was a great moment. And for me, you know, just watching the conference, I was like, holy, you know, I have to to make sure I do my best. This is like this is happening. PS2 is coming and I'm gonna be involved. Did you ever end up like browsing social media or YouTube and just like watching VODs of people reacting to the PSO2 announcement at E3? Oh, not only I did that, but I I compiled an entire report on it. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think that's a secret for anyone, but um, it's clear that community management is a multifaceted endeavor. You're not just running Twitter. It's, it's so many tasks in, encapsulated into one thing that's hard to break down. But one of the most important things uh, for a community manager is to collect sentiment and is just to collect uh, feedback, is to collect the perceived voice of the, your audience and to build uh, personas upon uh, what your players are like. And one of the first things that I did was actually I needed to understand the reaction behind the A3 announcement. Mm. And and I did. Uh, I I am a very data driven person, but I'm also a very um, analytical person. 
I like to put everything on paper and kind of understand it that way. Um, but it was a great stepping stone into understanding the community in general because I'm going to be honest, PSO2 is a very unique project. It was from the beginning. Uh, I don't think any community manager, and I, I might be speaking out of line, but I think I'm the only community manager that was in the situation uh, that was launching PSO2 where there's already a huge pre-established community that has been playing the game. Yeah, for sure. Um, so one of my biggest platforms and one of the first things I advocated for is, hey, we have to make sure their voices are heard, that the JP community is appreciated and acknowledged, because I feel like if a different corporation ran the show autonomously without a, an input from a community manager they would try to pretend JP never existed, right? That's true. Um, because technically it was something that was away from our demographics. It was a, a community that established itself via, um, you know, ways. That, it's a word that it's thrown around, but I don't think it's true, like, uh, like illegal <laughs> in any way. Uh, and actually, uh, sorry to, to go on a tangent here, but uh, this is the first time I'm talking PSO2 as a player and as a fan of the game on a public setting. So I just want to give a huge shout out to the Arc Slayer people and Ada and everyone that that is so passionate for PSO2 that they make sh made sure the players had access to it even before it was possible. So it's amazing. I think it's an effort that just shows the the power and the weight of the PSO2 community and how um, how long it lasted all these years of just the commitment to make, make sure, you know, we appreciate PSO2 and, and fans of the star in general. So yeah, shout out there. <laughs> yeah, definitely. It, it is quite the unique experience, even for myself as well, because believe it or not, I, 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 do, I do say this here and there and like other podcast with people when I'm like introducing my background or something like that or I said it on stream here and there when people ask but PSO2 is actually my first online MMO game like the real the first real game that I've ever really played because for me as like an Asian kid right my family especially is a from a musical background so I'm generally always playing music for like at least like I don't know eight hours a day and everything and I don't really have a lot of hobbies so I never really got to play video games until like much later on until like my middle school life or something like that and yeah PSO2 is like my first ever real like community and everything so it's quite a unique thing because despite being in from the japan side of the world right it's like wow i did not expect this big of a global community on the japan side of pso2 and i would probably imagine that you would have to really think about a lot of that as well and also a lot of the players from that end which may be moving over to the western release even if it, uh, if it yeah sorry even if it's eight years after that yeah so honestly we we really didn't know what it what you expect we knew the passion was there um but we also knew that we we needed to understand that community and to work with building upon the foundation that already existed right uh so not only you know Whenever you hear someone working community, there's a huge chance they, they had a title familiarization process everywhere that I worked with or people that I know. They go through a period in which they're just playing the game, they're, they're chatting, they're interacting with players online, they're joining guilds, alliances, whatever. <laughs> uh, so that was, the, that was very important is to know what, what, what was valuable to the community, right? Because that's what we would focus on it. I remember one of the first strategies we had was, okay, they know PSO2 is coming. What should we first start talking about um, on Twitter and on social and on a website? And I was like, well, we have to focus on the players that don't know about the game, but we also have to, to nod and, and acknowledge the JP community that's there for whatever is novel, right? So whenever we started doing the talking points, I remember one of the first things, like, we have to do a tweet or just a post that announces that we're getting freaking English voice acting. Mm. And I remember, uh, I think right now it's so commonplace that, that people forget, but at the time, imagine you're playing PSO2 for eight years 
and um, you're expecting some commitment but it, i mean it's a huge game with eight years worth of content i don't think anyone expected the the voice acting to be there and to be of great quality like i love the dubs yeah i i think a lot of the pso2 english dub was actually a lot more well done than i actually expected because you know with the whole anime community and all that a lot of people would think like oh man it's english voices and like there's the part of the community that's always <laughs> like yeah no english dub is like no Right. I mean, hey, I, I'm I've always been the sub gang, you know. <laughs> I, I'm I'm sub through and through, uh, but because not only was my job, but it, it was kind of a like a like an aspect of pride in the project. Hey, we're getting English voice. I think I actually played it. Piazza is probably one of the only games that I played with the English dubs, mm. just because I wanted to. Like, hey, this is something unique to Global. This is an effort put. In this project that I, you know, contributed in, and honestly, I was surprised. I actually was like, "Okay, have I been missing out on good dubs all this time?" Uh, Emma, yeah. So, yeah. So it was one of the talking points, and the the tweet at the time blew up because I knew that tweet was for the JP community. I knew, I knew the people that have never heard of the game. Like, why does it matter if it's English dub? That's such a normal thing to happen in the industry nowadays. Yeah. But for the JP community, it's like they were going to, you know, freak out just for the fact that it's something different and unique. Yeah. And the, the same thing with, you know, with voice chat or with mission passes, all the, all the aspects that we introduced in global that were different from, um, from Japan, we took the extra care to make sure uh, we were not only doing that for for the new uh, and growing community, but also for the you know for the established community that was already there. And stuff like you say about the mission pass and stuff is still implemented in the game today too. So it's quite impressive that hey, some ideas that actually came from the global is like actually being implemented more or less permanently, even on the Japan side as well. But regardless of like the ideas and like all that stuff, though, I have to say that about the voice acting part, right? Personally, for me, because being from this end of the world, I'm here like, yeah, I'm super used to the Japan voice dubbing because it's like normal thing to me, right? Because even if I go out to like watch the news in the television or just go out on the streets anywhere, it's like, yeah, that's it's Japanese everywhere <laughs> because <laughs> I'd be living in like Okinawa and stuff, right? So mm -hmm. it's kind of like, yeah, I did not expect the English voice acting at all. And then just like having me getting a chance to talk to Stefan, also one of the person who voices a character and he voices Elmir, right? Or Dark Falls Persona, as you might know. It's really, really personally eye opening to me in how much work, how much effort, how much passion just goes into, you know, having to have these English voice actors also learn about like how the Japanese voicing goes and then what the company expects from them and things like that. It, it just opens a whole new appreciation for me. And I just feel it, it's such a wonderful thing, honestly. Yeah, and honestly, what, what blew me out of the water at the time was how they they actually did the, the Kuna songs Yeah, in English. That to me was like, fan that was like mind blowing. At the time, I remember we got, of course, we had access to it early, uh, but not as er as much earlier than you think. So, but we did get you freak out a little bit. I remember the first concert we ever hosted on the closed beta, and we made sure, you know, there was a, a website notice, a tweet, we made it into this event, right? Yeah. And the closed beta became so memorable because of it. I remember I was still in the office and we. We actually blasted the the Kuna concert on the screen in the office, and everyone was kind of watching. Uh, someone logged in, and then we're just there and, and checking it out. And to me, I think that the, the whole closed beta experience, the way we framed it, as it was more than like a closed beta, it became kind of like this this experience that that was reminiscent of old school MMORPGs <laughs> kind of experiences. Yeah. Uh, so I come from a history of playing a lot of online games. Uh, probably the reason I'm a community manager today is because I was heavily involved with the community of this game called Ragnarok Online when I was a kid. Oh, Ragnarok. Uh, okay. And I played that when I was, uh, uh, I don't know. I lost so many years of like 
my like my <laughs> middle grade to like early high school to that game, and then I started playing Lineage Two, which is another MMO. Mm. So of of course, it's the kind of thing that I don't usually have the time nowadays. Uh, work as an adult um, to play a lot of MMOs, uh, but that's also one of the things that that I loved about PSO Two was that it was the kind of game that kind of respected your time. Mm. And uh, yeah. Uh, I lost my train of thought, but I actually have a question since we're in the topic of translation. I have a question for you. Mm. And it's a question that you have to answer right now. Ooh, okay. Darkers or false spawn? <laughs> so, here, here's my line of thought, right? I, ha- I had a lot of people ask me this one question as well. And I will say that... The reason that the the story should at least like call them darkers, at least at first, is because in the story, in like episode one and stuff like that, it was not revealed until the very end that the darkers are actually, you know, the minions Related of the Dark the, Falls. Yeah. So technically calling them false spawn before you clear the story and stuff like that is spoilers that's true i think maybe they could have worked something where they call it just spawns until that is revealed or something along those lines but honestly as an avid reader of fantasy and things like that i love these unique terms yeah and if i were coming into an intellectual property blind and and i i see the the, the jp community's point 100 percent You've, you've been used to it for so many years. It makes total sense with the lore. The name is Darker. Why change that? But if I want to come into a, a game blind, I think that the term false spawn sounds more interesting. And I think it was really just that. A lot of people trying to to attribute you know, the change to another reason beyond just that but i think they're just looking for a a term that sounded cool and without the context of playing the game for seven eight years darker is not that great of a name (laughs) i'm gonna i'm gonna put it out there and i know it's gonna be controversial but uh, to me it just sounds strange oh they are the darker darkers um i don't know i might be remembering this whole situation like wrong or misremembering because it's been so long Mm -hmm. but i remember it was one of those things that it was just so interesting to see the like which camp people fell into uh but at the end of the day it was one of those things like either term is fine it's it's a localization thing right yeah uh but both experiences are there if you switch the voice to japanese you still hear darker yeah um it's just a different term localizations happen all the time i mean english is not my first language whenever i I used to read a book in Portuguese. They would translate some of the terms and names of the <laughs> characters and things like that. And I, as a purist, it would really like rub me the wrong way. I remember the most egregious one, and that's going way out of the topic. But growing up, for some reason, the translation translators of the Harry Potter books in Brazil translated Draco Malfoy to Drago Malfoy. Oh, for no reason. It, it, I, I guess it just sounded a little bit closer to portuguese which is my native language but that's one of those things that like why change it if it's working right so i understand why people that like the term darker is like why change it it's like it's already established but it's just interesting i mean it's localization yeah i I personally do agree (laughs) with like the localization part because even if you think of like other franchise names for example like pokemon as a really really big one it's like Mm -hmm. would you rather call piplup as piplup or would you rather call it Pochama, which is like his actual name? Yeah, I mean, I feel like if, if Pokemon had launched in the context of 2021, where there's a, a bigger effort into uh, keeping these terms as they are and being and doing like a more faithful acquisition, maybe they wouldn't have changed the names of the Pokemon. But I think it makes total sense, right? Because at the end of the day, uh, those names in Japan, they have uh, a deeper meaning too. So they're just trying to translate the, the sentiment behind what, like the, the strategy behind naming those, those Spock and Monsters, right? Uh, <laughs> I, do, I do like a lot of the English localized names. Yeah. I think they're really, really well done and intelligent. Exactly. Yeah, I love them. And I, I, I do love how they kept Pikachu. And I think that's great too. <laughs> you know? Yeah, there there's a few that's definitely kind I mean but... they, they didn't change it to Spark Rat or something like that. 
But yeah. Anyways, just to bring it back a little bit. Yes. Speaking of like the whole launch of PSO2 and everything, despite the whole pandemic and everything, did you actually expect the launch of Global to be as smooth as it was? <laughs> At least I, I know there's, of course, like a few bumps here and there and everything like that. But in, in retrospect, talking with just my community and just a lot of the PSO2 creators and community in general, I think it's a general sentiment that everybody thinks that, hey, you know, the launch was very smooth, all things considered. <laughs> how, how do you see it from your perspective on with like the company and everything? So being on the other side and knowing how, how hard I was working back then, uh, I would say the launch of PSO2 both surpassed expectations. I'm not going to say it surpassed everyone's expectations. It definitely surpassed mine. Uh, when it comes to the audience, right? The, the the attention that the game got. I think it was a snowball. It just kept growing steadily. It wasn't it didn't blow up, it didn't went viral. But as far as game launches go, for a game that has been, you know, eight years in waiting and had somehow already a split community, uh it it had a lot of love behind it. I think that's that summarizes the the community was there, the engagement was there. As for smooth, I don't think that's the word I would use. <laughs> uh, I have flashbacks of that Microsoft Store that I'm never gonna rub out of my brain. Oh uh, yeah, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, about about that. <laughs> so that was uh, it, it. It was what it was. I mean, I think at the end of the day, people just love uh, assigning blame, right? Uh, it's either you know this person's this entity's blame this entity's blame but it was just an unfortunate situation and it's not uncommon for that platform that there have a lot of there have been a lot of launches like that right yeah uh but all things considered i think the steam launch and that's one that we could really have fun with collaborations and that was one a very global thing that we did which is to secure those items from half-life oh man fortress and portal that one when I when I saw it personally, I was just like, "What?" Oh, <laughs> it hundred percent makes here. sense, right? Because like yeah. this this theme thing, it's like, yeah, this is the thing, right? But like, same it, here. It, yeah. it was just totally not expected. And honestly, shout out to the Valve guys too, because uh, Valve is amazing. Though that, that was such a good relationship, so easy to work with them. And Microsoft too. Like, uh, we PSO two was lucky in our partners too. I think it was great for me as a someone who's a enthusiast for you know gaming and new to the gaming industry just getting to know the people and the players and launch this game that has a passionate following uh yeah it wasn't smooth but it was still a very successful launch and i think it was great and you know after the steam launch and everything and, and things kind of stabilized mm -hmm. uh that's when kind of the work began right because uh, remember our roadmap remember that we launched eight years worth of content in less than a year yeah and that to me is unprecedented it's quite the quite the crazy feat like did you actually know that you had to you know handle that entire team of like releasing content after content after content <laughs> at the very beginning did you expect it to actually just be finished by a year or did you like you know, think like, hey, we, we're going to do this bit by bit by bit? Or like, were you actually just told like, okay, we're going to have to do this? Yeah, so I knew we were launching content at a steady pace. What I didn't know was the volume and the scope of what uh, our team needed to do. So this is a great opportunity to talk a little bit about the day-to-day. -day. Uh, I'm sure there are people listening that might, you know, want to work in the industry or work in community management. So as I said before, uh, it's a very multifaceted job. You are juggling between um, creating content, so content creation for for whatever social accounts you have officially, but also our website. It's a lot of people don't know. Some community teams handle all the content on the website, and that was us. And you're collecting sentiment, you're moderating, you're running the forums, you're ensuring that if you're a good community manager, that you're fostering a welcoming and helpful community. That's that's kind of what I my goal was. At the end of the day, active is good, uh, faithful, loyal is good, but what I wanted was welcoming and helpful. And I think uh, the GP you know, community was instrumental in that. Uh, you guys did a great job just welcoming everyone in, newcomers, 
having that already established was fantastic. But working with you closely, and even people like you, RC, I, I know uh, I reached out to you mm -hmm. uh, very early on, and because I I saw not only potential, but there was so much uh, charm and love and dedication to to the game that it's like we have to you know know these people. We have to make sure um, they are with us, right? They are. Uh, in conversation with us, they are appreciated, and that's one of the aspects that I really wish it could do more. Um, but yeah, uh, going back to starting the project in general, I was charged to building the team from the ground up, and at one point we reached seven people on the community team alone. And what that entails is we had uh, people uh, running uh, social, we had Uh, someone dedicated to writing all the articles on the website and just think about yeah uh, how many of those we had to pump out every week because it was uh, eight years worth of content, right? And uh, something that people don't know and the scope of it is that all the assets, 100% of the assets, we pretty much had to produce internally ourselves. So all the thumbnails in those articles, mm -hmm. all the banners, everything that you saw, we had to do ourselves for global specifically, right? It wasn't a, a joint effort. Uh, so, you know, our team had graphic designers. It had capture artists doing beautiful screenshots and things like that. So GM Rappi and GM uh, Bima, which is also Z, who ran the Instagram yeah, Z and created Harper and all that. So she, you know, uh, th both of them took beautiful screenshots, capture all the footage for the videos, for the scratch tickets, all that. <laughs> uh, shout out to them. They are fantastic. Not only were they super fun to get with at work, but they were best friends. So there are always great interactions in the office too. Uh, we had a uh, GM danger writing everything. She was our writer and she did an excellent job writing and making sure every, you know, All the information was accurate and comparing it and getting revisions and all that. Mm -hmm. One of the questions that I actually had that my community personally really wanted to know, because since my community is a little bit more of like the, you know, artsy kind of thing, because my, me as a brand, I do a lot of these like character designs and just like presentation and just branding stuff, right? So what they really wanted to know and I've been asked this a lot, is how the PSO2 global side handled the quote-unquote branding of the global Fantasy Star Online 2 compared to, like, the Japan side? Did you actually look at the Japan side for the inspiration a lot? Or, like, what did you look for inspiration? And how did you come up with, like, the process of, like, hey, this is, like, the look we're going to go for and things of that sort? So that is very important. And one of the first things that we did is we... We set out to differentiate ourselves from the, the JP, right? We were looking at it as a as a different service. Uh, and that affected our branding efforts. And that's a great question because it ties into how we wanted to build the brand and the community here in global. And that was kind of built on three platforms. And that's, that's kind of what I'm bringing with me to every project moving forward mm. is so the three platforms are empathy so we what what does it mean to to create uh em, to be uh to have empathy when it comes to to this kind of content is that we we will be helpful patient uh bubbly and happy and polite so that's kind of the the voice that they had early on on twitter and on our uh, website notices and it's something that aligned with uh, just the community and the helpfulness that I saw and that I had it perceived. Uh, then it's authenticity. And basically what it means is that we wanted to be self-aware. We wanted to be able to acknowledge the issues and we wanted to be able to speak to the players as fans because we were and we love PSO2. Uh, and we wanted to make sure uh, whenever people read our content and interacted with us that they could share that with friends. Oh, these people get it. Like, they're one of us. And that's when we got to be playful and we did a lot of things. Like, uh, there's a tweet specifically that I remember writing and it was something like, join the darker side <laughs> instead of dark side. And it was just playing with uh, whatever was already established and just a tongue-in-cheek kind of thing. 
Uh, and uh, speaking of authenticity, I think the most important thing you must avoid, and like you should avoid at all costs, is being tone deaf, right? Mm. So you don't want to be tone deaf uh, and like share a message when there is an underlying issue or when there's an la- underlying problem that hasn't been addressed. So acknowledging and addressing problems while you know keeping things positive was something that was very much part of the brand early on and yeah the third pillar okay so empathy (laughs) and authenticity and oh my god i'm drawing a blank but i have it written down somewhere that's okay while while you think of that I, i can talk about the whole thing about authenticity for a little bit because since since you said that hey you know it's important to understand that okay if you made a mistake or there's any jarring issues, it's important to not, you know, just leave it blank and stuff like that. I think is one of the biggest things that people are really talking about right now in this situation with New Genesis. Because, you know, with the whole thing about COVID and everything, it is very hard for the company to actually work on development and things like that. I know that Sega of Japan has been telling all the employees and stuff to have to like, hey, you have to work at home and things. And then we don't exactly know how much the development of New Genesis has been, you know, hampered or so by the actual pandemic and things of the sort. But at the end of the day, I think a lot of players are really waiting for, hey, any updates of what's going on and things like that. So I think with the latest NGS headlines and stuff where they're starting to put in operation reports and really just talking about player feedback and things, I I feel like it's reconnecting and reestablishing like a certain connection with the community and people understand that like, hey, you guys actually are hearing what we're talking about. Like, for example, whether people be complaining about like the lack of content right now with the game or like a lot of certain other issues and things like that. Having now a player survey, having now a whole operation report segment, having now just general acknowledgments of, hey, we hear what's going on with the community and we're working on it. Just even by saying a small bit of that from the official sources, right? I think really gives players a sense of like reassuring kind of thing. You know, you you feel like, yo, the community's managers or like the whole game devs or anything is like listening. Our voices are being heard. We put in the effort for the game and the game is respecting us back. And I, I think it's very, very important. Absolutely. So... Just a, a step back, and I'm going to comment on your, uh, on your thing real quick. So the three pillars will be empathy and authenticity, as I said, which is self-awareness. And the last is transparency. And I didn't know why I blanked out on that. Mm. But it basically <laughs> but basically, that falls into what you talked about. And transparency was basically one of the things that I, that I took the most effort to make sure we had early on. Uh, but that's kind of the hurdles of working for a big company, right? Uh, there's a difference between being transparent and being perceived as transparent, as transparent. And of course, there's a lot of things that we can't announce or we can't acknowledge without confirmation, without knowing exactly what the talking points are. But I always strived personally for transparency, and I think as a player, that's very important. And to talk about um, this, the recent shift with New Genesis, uh, I've been taking a look at it. Uh, I'm still a fan of the game. Uh, to be honest, I haven't played since maybe... Uh, month one or two i got my hunter to to 20 i got all the skills and basically i've been waiting for a content uh i want to try bouncer out but uh, maybe i'll wait for the new region but on that light uh what i talked about is the last thing you want as a brand is to be tone deaf right and i'm not really gonna comment on a lot about you know uh what's happening right now i think um right as a fan we're all as fans, we we just want the game to do well, right? Everyone loves PSO2. We see the tremendous potential in it. Uh, I think a little bit of patience is warranted because uh, inevitably the game was going to be good, right? If you remember uh, PSO2 back in 2012 in Japan, the, the, <laughs> you know, the, the content was doled out uh, very slowly, but eventually uh, chipping away a little, a little bit of a time at a time uh, the game became fantastic, 
it became what it is. Yeah. So if we see the return to form, if we see like things that I'm personally looking forward to, maybe concerts are back, yes. you know? So uh, I trust the story behind the, the PSO2 title. You know, I trust the potential in it. Uh, but of course, you don't want to be tone deaf. So I think one of the, the things that really concerned me and turned me as a player was the, I think one of the first surveys they sent out was regarding monetization or scratch tickets. Oh, uh, that one, yeah. So that's an example of tone deaf. But at the same time, I think now they're doing it right, right? I love uh, Hito. I love what they're doing uh, with the the headlines. And I think acknowledging the, the comments and addressing them live, and, and not, not live, but at least on the, on the context of those videos. And it, it just gives players what they want, which is reassurance. They have yep. they have time invested in that. They have money invested in it, and they they have a passion and a commitment. And again, we all know how successful it can be because the potential is there. So please just let us know that you guys are working on this. That you know that these are problems, and those are being addressed. And that's that's really it. Like uh, you you will foster a, a positive community. If you if you give them the resources to to think about the potential and, and what's coming, uh, I think all all games have hurdles, mm-hmm. and uh, the pandemic has not been easy. Uh, honestly, for Japan, it probably was worse because I I think culturally and the way uh, the work is set out there is not really well adapted to work from home. Uh, so I think even infrastructure-wise, there was a, a, a steeper learning curve than it was here. Uh, but honestly, there's probably a lot of effort from the global team in even getting you know, Hito there to, to read and to acknowledge those issues. I'm sure it's something that's echoed not only from the Japanese community over there, but from uh, from the efforts put by the, the Sega of America folks there uh, doing the job now. And I think it's great. I'm, I'm really excited for the future. Uh, I think uh, one of the negatives, I guess, of our tremendous effort to launch PSO2 in one year with all the content was acclim- acclimatizing people to expect content to be released at that pace. Yeah. Which is very unrealistic. I mean, that was a lot. That was a lot. That was a lot for us, you know. Um and uh, and it's just not gonna be that that way. Uh, I think could New Genesis have waited a year and launched a little bit more robust? Sure, uh, but but either they're working on New Genesis or they're working on you know content updates for PS2. Uh, there's no way to fill in that year otherwise. Um, but it's gonna get there. Uh, uh, one of my parting tweets before I left the project was, I'm looking forward to seeing what the future holds for the game. And that still stays true. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely for sure. Because the, the thing is, like, you have to understand, right, that base PSO2 even never actually got good until, like, three years in, in my personal opinion. So that that's like, yeah. I understand where people are coming from, though, in terms of expectations and things of the sort, because number one, we have already an eight year of PSO2, and people are not necessarily treating New Genesis as like a new, new game. And it's like rather as just like a small, you know, expansion towards PSO2, at least like that. That's what the players should think of it as. But that's reality not the case because a lot of the people who's never played fantasy star online 2 before or just like hearing news about new genesis will always think of it as like a completely brand new game and they're just expecting a plethora of content because hey man pso2 already had eight years so new genesis should have like a ton of content right but no that's not the case yeah i think one of the things that uh i think it's worrying and i i understand completely the community is that the context of live service games, especially free to play, from 2012 is very different from what it is now. For sure, the com- the competition is fierce. Uh, there's 
way more things, not only to get your patronage, but also your time, right? Uh, it's uh, Piesa 2 is not, it's the only behemoth within its scope. It's there are more titles out there that, that do what Piesa 2 did uniquely in 2012 and a few years after that. Uh, they are doing that as well. Um, and, I, you know, I'm going to mention them, but I'm not saying that one is better than the other. But, uh, you know, Genshin Impact is here. And Final Fantasy XIV, those are behemoths. Mm-hmm. There is New World if you're more keen to, to Western-style uh, games. Um, so there are options, even when it comes to live service. Uh, one thing that I think... PS2 did exceedingly well, and it kind of became the the inspiration for a lot of popular titles you see nowadays. Uh, I honestly think you know there wouldn't be Destiny without PSO, uh, but I think it, it respected your time in the structure you had before. So PS2 Classic, to me, was perfect. You had it was compartmentalized, an area in which you you hung out and socialized, and you could easily access gameplay with a few you know dialogue button clicks with the the navigator right yeah uh it was there you could have a 20 minute session you could have a three hour session you could jump in only when the time was appropriate for the you know the origin quest you had you know you put in your calendar you go for it uh and i think that's uh there was a paradigm shift to new genesis and now they're trying to do an open world game in which I think nowadays the world is more keen to understand the lobby style live service than they were when PS2 was doing its own thing, right? Uh, we have Warframe, we have Destiny, you have all these games that kind of use the same gameplay loop. Yeah. Uh, and it's something that I miss. And as a player, that's, that's pretty much the only negative thing I'm going to have to say about... Uh, new Genesis because I think honestly the game has potential is going to get there but I think the negative thing is that I wish they had kept support for PS2 Classic because uh, it was still fantastic we just got caught up and I think uh, the idea of having both games in one client or you know one game with two <laughs> with an expansion I don't know there's always a, a messaging uh, issue there uh, I see New Genesis uh, as its own iteration, but it definitely, you know, syncs up with PS2 in some aspects. You can transfer your character back and forth. Mm-hmm. And I wish, you know, people are complaining about lack of content, but man, if if we had kept a uh, steady flux of, uh, you know, mini events and concerts and things to do in PS2 Classic, and we already have a welcoming and friendly community there to say, hey, Let's let's you know do some things in classic while we wait for content on uh, New Genesis. Yeah, I thought that was the plan, right? Uh, so we would have beach wars, we have all these events, uh, <laughs> and and that's what I I hoped for. When I first knew about the system and how we no, we're not starting from scratch. Players are gonna keep you know their stuff. Their PS2 classic is not going anywhere. I was so happy because I thought that we would still get you work in PS2. And classic would be there to stay, right? Uh, and I'm not saying like I don't know anything, so I I honestly don't know if if they they get a classic or they have no plans to go back to it. But I think um, it's a missed opportunity to to have us engaged and playing classic. I would still be around in classic, you know. Yeah. Um, if if there's still stuff to do there, so that that's that's the only negative for me. Uh, I really wish they had kept both in tandem. It, it doesn't have to be anything fancy, but you know, campaigns, daily rewards, the the you know, yearly events at least, uh, things along those lines, seasonal events. I think that would be fun, uh, and would definitely bring people in while we wait for New Genesis. And hey, you want to go kill some dolls? Just hop into New Genesis and do that. You know, it's actually kind of funny because it's something that me and Cami has been talking about a lot. In terms of like, hey, you know, let's go back to play PS2 Classic. Because especially for the global side, I understand that it's a bit of a weird thing, right? Because you guys had all the content rush and like, yeah, you only had 
the game officially for like a year and then i feel like it is really something that a lot of players can really jump back into and just really enjoy and maybe it is the fact that they're just trying to focus first on new genesis to the very beginning and then we'll see what happens between both games but i guess that's something for the future to really think about Although I have to admit that at, at least recently I've been playing I've been playing PSO2 Classic a lot more than New Genesis. Maybe it's just because my personal sentiment with the game because I've been with the game for basically like what eight nine years now at this point. But I, I I do find I do find a very different charm in both games. Well, Classic didn't magically become a bad game just because there's a new iteration of the franchise out, you know. Uh, People, just because New Genesis is around, see it as obsolete. But honestly, it's a fantastic game. I love Classic. Um, and yeah, seeing su- support. I can guarantee you, if you put, you know, We Are Rx, if you put Kuna there, if you, I don't know, uh, even bring some of the collaborations we didn't have a chance to bring uh, on year one mm. to PS2 Classic, people would be invested, right? Uh, and again, I, I I don't speak on behalf of... Uh, of of the current administration. I don't know what's going on there. Maybe there is a plan for a classic. They're just focusing on your Genesis, as you said. I hope that's true. Although speaking, um, speaking of that, right? When, yeah. when you were talking about like collaborations, uh, the other night, was it last night or something like that? Uh, as of the time of this recording, it's basically last night. But yeah, uh, they actually announced a Attack on Titan collaboration I rerun. On the glo- <laughs> and it's only yeah. on the global side, by the way. Japan actually doesn't get that. Huh, that's interesting. I guess uh, because it was missed for us in global. So it's an opportunity uh, to get some attention there. Uh, I honestly love it. Uh, I, yeah. I'm a huge fan of Evangelion, so I hope they bring that eventually. I mean, oh, yes, the Evangelion event would be so fun. If they did Attack on Titan, why not, right? Uh, I think the last one we did besides the Attack on Titan that's coming now was uh, Sword Art Online. Yeah. Uh, and honestly with the scope of everything that we're already launching and how challenging it is to secure licensing for collaborations uh, in different countries uh, I'm surprised by by the amount that we actually put out you know that was uh, that was quite a lot for for a year of content in which we're already releasing all that stuff yeah it is for sure yeah I I really cannot express how much work was uh was put into the the first year uh, of launching PS2. I think it's a case study for any... I don't think we're ever going to have anything like that in the industry again. Like a a game that launches eight years from the original, you know, release date. Yeah. It was just unprecedented. uh, Like if I ever have to go through job interviews again, that's one of the things like, like if I worked on that project, I can work anywhere. Uh, there's nothing you can throw at me that <laughs> that I can't bounce back. <laughs> so that's pretty much it. Uh, but so as not to say that it wasn't challenging, especially with the pandemic and work from home and stuff like that. But but we we survived. Yeah. Speaking <laughs> of collaboration, though. So, yeah. Nathan, do you have a dream collab for PSO two? <laughs> Oh, that's uh, that's so funny. That's interesting that you asked because it's so random. Um, I know people with PS2 collaborations, they always expect uh, anime or JRPG adjacent, right? Yeah. Uh, and so what, this is one of the things I advocated for. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't have a lot of autonomy. That's that's mainly one of the reasons. <laughs> that, Understandable. Yeah, I, I'm not going to get into detail, but let's leave it at that. But I actually wanted to to have uh, collaborations that were unique to global and actually efforts that would take advantage of what makes PSO2 unique. Not only collaborations, but like, man, why aren't we not? Why aren't we utilizing the in-game monitors as much as we could? Mm-hmm. And I'm glad eventually we got arcs hours, uh, arcs hour videos in there and the arcs minute stuff. I think that was so cute. Oh yeah, I w- I was genuinely surprised by that. Yeah. I thought it was such a good idea. I know. I wish we had done that sooner because I keep remembering the Sonic trailer and the close beta and how fantastic it was. <laughs> Still, uh, uh, have you ever heard of this animation studios called Cartoon Hangover? If you haven't, that's okay. No, I haven't. It's very unknown. So it's an indie animation studios, and they do a few series that used to be just on YouTube, and then it became its own thing. But one of the series that I loved for Cartoon Hangover was called Bravest Warriors. I feel like I've heard that name before. Yes, from the creator of Adventure Time. 
Uh, it's super cute. It had a lot of bubbly, cute characters like, uh, uh, ah, oh my god, Catbug. Uh, so if you haven't seen it, uh, or anyone that's listening to the podcast, please go ahead and watch it. You can watch everything <laughs> in like a couple seatings. Uh, but I just felt like, I don't think there's an intellectual property that would match so well with Pesuchu as this if we wanted to, to do something more, not only unique to global, but as, a small project in a scope, right? I don't think I have the, the capacity as a community manager to go and secure, you know, a, a collaboration with a big brand. But I, I think I could, you know, find my way into talking to the Curtain Hangover folks and get that going. And it's, it's a sci-fi little animation show. It's, it's freaking cute. The characters are awesome. I thought not only potential for outfits, but the, the episodes are really short. They're like, maybe 10 minutes a pop. I, I don't think even that. So like, why not do a collaboration and a showing? Like a, like a, put it on a calendar, like urgent quest and just have little episodes occur to, or of, of like bravest warriors playing <laughs> and in uh, the monitors. And I, I thought of, about that for a lot of things, right? Like think of Fortnite nowadays and how, how the game became a, a behemoth of live service, uh, just projects. And it, they have movie showings, they have concerts, and they have all that stuff. But it, think about how PSO2 was the precursor for all that kind of stuff. You know, we had screens way before any other game did. We had, you know, concerts. Uh, and I think we <laughs> we could have explored that a different way with Global. But of course, there's a lot of arguments uh, that is that are completely understandable. Not only we're keeping to schedule, but you know we can't really do a huge commitment like that that is not in JP. You know, at the end of the day, uh, I think what what they were aiming for uh, was just to to make it a uh, cohesive uh, service between global and Japan, right? Uh, because otherwise, it's a lot of effort put into two services that operate autonomously. Uh, at which, which is what it was for a while. That's why I said like we're creating all the content from scratch for PSG Classic, and now I believe they probably are not. I believe like the the website notices and banners and all this stuff are pretty much aligned. JP and yeah, they're pretty sync right now. And I think that makes sense. I think effort wise, bandwidth wise, I think operations wise, uh, that was the right move. But I still think we we should have had or kept some of the global identity unique, you know? Uh, it's essentially different markets in a sense. Yeah. Uh, for instance, bring Arcs Hour, Hour back, you know, talk to more content creators. I'm, I'm dying to, to, to have community content again. Uh, I think uh, even exploring some more avenues along those lines, um, I would love to see the, 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 the current global team to have a bigger platform an agency, uh, and I think that's definitely what I wanted when I was a community manager. But I still hope that they they get there. Uh, mm-hmm. I love the game, uh, and I think everyone there is doing their best, and they are great. All of them are great people, um, and everyone's just doing their best. Uh, and again, guys, I know there's a lot of negative sentiment going around the community. I know people are waiting for content, but um, uh, there are two things. A, I think PS2 is a beloved game. New Genesis is a, is a continuation of that. And I think uh, it's going to get good eventually. It definitely will. Mm-hmm. There is no way in hell that in three years New Genesis hasn't ironed out you know, what makes what made PS2 great and applied that and, and kind of honed everything that is kind of still growing pains right now. Uh, and B... Um, if you cannot really deal with uh, the slow, you know, content output, you can. There's no, you know, there's no problem taking a breather, taking a break, playing something else. Uh, you know, broadening your horizon. You can still be a part of the community, see what's going on, but you know, take your time, pile it up. That's what I do with manga. You know, I hate <laughs> waiting for manga to come out weekly. I forget that shit exists. <laughs> and I'm sorry. I, I just forget it exists and then, you know, like a year or two later I have so many chapters spelled up and then I just get through. Unless you're reading Hunter Hunter and then you just said. <laughs> but but yeah, that's what I do. So there's no wrong in that. Um it, 
it'll be here, you know. Uh, and hopefully, by the time you come back, it'll be awesome. Yeah. And you have a lot to experience. It's one of the things that I always tell my stream community and everything is don't make your relationship with your game like a toxic one, mm-hmm. right? There's there's not exactly anything that is always like telling you to, hey, you have to play this game all the time. You have to only play this game or something. I always tell them like, while you're waiting for a game with no content to have content, just go play a game with content. Absolutely. And, and again, as I said, uh, a lot of people fra- like frame their reality as like uniquely to them. For instance, even I am guilty of that sometimes. Like if I'm not watching a given TV show or or if I stopped watching something, I, I have that perception that it's either going to fail or oh it's gonna get canceled soon because I, I you know I doubt people are watching this. But that that's just me, you know. Uh and I feel like, yeah, uh take some time off, mm. uh come back to it with a fresh perspective, uh bring in your best self to whatever gaming community you're at. Uh, I definitely feel like the the hard stance on, on uh, you know harassment and toxic behavior is here to stay. It's 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 industry wide. It's not unique to PSO2, and I applaud them for taking that step. Uh, because at the end of the day, uh, again, what we're striving for is a welcoming and helpful community. Mm-hmm. That's all we can do. Uh, and behind the scenes, that's very important. Uh, I don't. I don't even know how to explain that within the context of all the research that goes into being a community manager. How many games have failed due to uh, a toxic or unwelcoming community? Uh, but it's a real concern. And, you know, if you're getting into a game that that has an environment that is not safe for the entire demographics... Uh, then it, it it's not gonna do well, and and it's and I say that, uh, just knowing that people have different sensibilities and they want to see something different from the game. For instance, I'm gonna be honest. I freaking love symbol art. Yeah, I love them. It's great. I love them to death. I I think they are fun. They are personable. They are fantastic. But they are too powerful a tool. And that's something that I, I thought whenever we were launching Global, which is like people don't understand how different it is, uh, just behavior in general, especially player behavior in Japan compared to Global. And I and I think that's one of the things Sega Japan had no idea. Mm. Uh, and, and, and that is not really a comment on Global because I think most players, uh, when given too much freedom, you know, they abuse it. <laughs> Uh, and I think that's common, uh, you know, I was a teenager once, I know what I did, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah. but at, at the end of the day, uh, the game is there for everyone and simple arts are great, but they're also like a, a tricky system and I wish they could stay and, and be heavily monitored and make sure that the content that is not suited, uh, ends up on the game, but it's it's a huge undertaking. It's it's challenging, uh, but I also don't you know don't want the tool to get limited. I don't want the the, the feature to to go away. It's such a, an integral and like important aspect of PSO two. It's been part of the PSO identity, right? Yep. Uh, that there is no easy solution, but but I think they're doing their best. Yeah, I think I had something else to say, but I I, I keep losing my train of thought. That's okay. Uh, but. But that's a very touchy subject. All I can say is that, uh, you know, just just be a, a helpful member of the community. If you love PSO2 and you want it to thrive, uh, then you're going to contribute it in a, in a positive light. And that doesn't mean not criticize. I, I think that's that's a, a major concern. I think uh, uh, as someone that's representing the brand, you do have to acknowledge shortcomings. You do have to make sure people uh, uh, are relieved that, you know, hey, we're acknowledging it and we're working on on issues, right? Uh, And I think leaving feedback, uh, criticizing constructively is amazing. And I think, you know, uh, that that, that only has a net positive in the game. Mm -hmm. We all want the game to do well, right? But yeah, there's a difference between feedback and... Just bashing. Uh, 
harassment. Yeah. Yeah. So if if you're unsure whether you're harassing or leaving feedback, then don't leave feedback because it's definitely harassment. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's that, that's quite the that's quite the way to put it. Yeah, and again, hey, I'm still in community management. I'm still doing my own thing. I'm still building a community, and um, those are aspects that are hard to navigate everywhere. Uh, at the end of the day, you do have to work hard on implementing not only stances and and proper guidelines and enforce them and moderate them in our communities but you also have to work with the developers you have to work with the live ops team you have to make sure that there are robust in-game systems that also make sure the game is toxicity free Mm. Uh, i know this is a very divisive topic in the community but i think a lot of the things that were shared behind a veil of conspiracy are most likely not true I think no company is not in their self-interest to overly censor or to um, overly police the you know the community. Right. Is I don't think that's true. But again, I'm not that closely in touch uh, nowadays with it. I am a player now. I I honestly, if I am to enjoy uh, a game, I usually I I. I joined the community as a player, so I don't have a horse in the race anymore. Mm-hmm. But I love Sega. I've loved it since I was a kid. Uh, and I love Atlas, which is now part of Sega. Mm-hmm. Huge Atlas fan, so shout out. And yeah, uh, I'm excited for the future of the game. Uh, I'll be there. Yeah. Speaking of like Atlas and stuff, though, are you are you excited for Shin Megami Tensei Five that's coming out this month? Oh, I'm freaking out. I'm, I'm running against time. <laughs> Because I'm, I'm replaying Nocturne, and I, 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 I was like, ah, I want to replay Nocturne before 5, right? But I started last week, and it's such a huge game, so I'm running against time because I barely have time to play during the week. Yeah. Uh, but I, I just waste so much time just fusing demons. <laughs> yeah, I love just building, like, the perfect, like, party in these type of games. I'm obsessed with Shin Megami Tensei. Yeah. It's probably <laughs> uh, top three favorite franchises. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm freaking out about about five. I've been waiting for it for so long. Uh, I think I I trust Atlas is probably my favorite uh, Japanese developer right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, they they're doing justice to the JRPG and turn based kind of gameplay mechanics, uh, <laughs> which I love. And of of course they fall into disuse for most of the AAA titles, but. <laughs> ah, man, I'm so excited! I could talk about Shin Megami. We can do a whole podcast just about Shin Megami Tensei. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in the future. Maybe in the future, yes. we'll see. But yeah, I I think I have a personal answer for this question. But this is something that I just have to ask, right? Because like me personally, as a content creator, you know, we always deal with a lot of toxicity as well when it comes to you know the comments and everything like that. But how you as a community manager, right? How do you deal with the toxicity on a personal level like for example like you know going on twitter and then you just see all these comments every day like how do you blow off steam or how do you be like let's let's chill about that because you know this is the same case for cammy as well because this is actually a question that cammy wants me to ask you because realistically right us as people in the industry like this like we have always say that like yeah man you can ignore the comments and stuff like that but in reality you know that doesn't really entirely work yeah i think at the end of the day we're all human and the whole idea of ignoring comments uh it's hard (laughs) it's 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 wishful thinking right because those comments especially if they're about you uh, they're about you man (laughs) like how, how can you not take them personally at some level uh myself uh so you know how people that work in the industry they usually often put on their twitter profile something along the lines of uh comments from my own you know yeah they don't represent whatever uh so um to speak it candidly at the end of the day you're i was gonna i was gonna swear but i thought that <laughs> anyway. but at at the end of the day uh your Twitter is still your public facing profile. It's still something that uh, employers are going to look at or potential employers are going to look at. It's uh, you, you still have to 
have PR mode turning on, turned on 100%. Yeah. Uh, my strategy for mitigating any type of thing is that I'm not really a controversial person in nature when it comes to things like that. I hate conflict. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm the type of person to avoid it. Uh, so I stay productive. What are the, the, the talking points that, that I not only I master and I know really well, but I feel comfortable talking about? And to me, that's video games, that's novels, that's fiction. The, that's, those are things I love. Uh, and staying productive pretty much means that uh, I'm inherently political. I have, you know, I live in America. I, have been, <laughs> I live in Los Angeles. Uh, e- you either are inherently political or you are completely desensitized to to whatever goes on on a daily basis here. So I have my own stance, uh, but the same way I run communities, I run my my personal uh, Twitter and I and I whatever limited presence I have online, which is not much. I'm not super active, but it is empathy, right? Mm. I think that's the first of the items that I mentioned is empathy. And it's just at the end of the day, uh, we all live in our own bubbles and those people that spread toxicity, they're not going to change their minds over that. Uh, But man, uh, the last thing I want is to have those people live in my head rent free. Yeah. So, you know, it's not about ignoring, it's about reading it, you know, acknowledging that the person wrote that and said, hey, that person is their own individual. There's nothing you can do about that. Uh, I think that they're, they're wrong, but, you know, at the end of the day, we're never going to meet each other. It's like... That's true. Like, social media is not actually real. It's just the, the way we interact nowadays. Uh, but I don't know, focusing on life and, and family in general, I think content creators have been way worse. I haven't really been, I, I think it's easier for me to say because I haven't really been targeted for harassment uh, yet. Uh, you know, as a community manager at one point, I'm bound to. Uh, but that's pretty much because I, I kept the talk the, the talking points productive. When it came to PSO2, even in the worst of times, you know, with the Windows 10 launch and stuff like that, whenever, whatever I could not share on the uh, official PSO2 account, I made sure, at least on my side, I talked to to the few that followed me, you know, the content creators, the people that that were there. Uh, pretty much, are, if if you found me on Twitter, you're a core audience, right? You're you're the most active uh, PS2 player you could be to have found me on Twitter. Yeah. So I made sure those people knew, hey, yeah, we were looking into this issue. Uh, we are working our best, you know. Everyone is is burning through, you know your fumes right now but you know we're, we're running a fumes but it uh but we're here uh, i'm not gonna go to sleep until the that, that the gets resolved i think that's something that i often mention is like i'm on my third cup of coffee but i'm here <laughs> keeping an eye on the situation we are seeing all your comments dudes don't worry about it um uh, and i think it worked in my favor i never really had that much of an issue um uh, I, I i usually stay away from drama and i don't engage and I think that if I were to give my advice to content creators in general, just don't engage. Um, it's okay to to read those comments and it's okay to feel whatever you have to feel and take some time off and process it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but engaging only makes it worse. Those people are not there to have their minds changed, right? Uh, they Some comments are just designed to make your day miserable. So... Keep that in mind and don't let them win. Yeah. Just have fun. Go play go play some, some Shin Megami Tensei, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I do I do think I do agree with that sentiment a lot because I, I'm kind of the same. First of all, like for, for me when it comes to like approaching content and things like that, it's like if you're genuine, people will see that you're genuine. And like there's no point to just get stuck on something that's already happened or things like that. It's like, yeah. Every time I feel kind of like down or something like that, whether it be because I read like really bad comments or just like felt really not so good about producing like a video or something that's not like super good quality and stuff like that, I just go back to the drawing board and either I just sit here playing music, draw or like try to draft some new ideas and things like that. Just like turn that, you know, negativity into fuel to just be like, yeah, I'm going to do better next time and just keep at it because that's really honestly the best that we can do, right? 
what what is the point of crying over spilled milk? It's already spilled. So yeah, it's 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 all you can do. Um, so I, I don't know if you ever watched the show uh, called I think it's Mythic Quest is for the creators of Always Always Sunny. I've definitely heard of that one. Okay, so uh, there's a, this episode that's really funny. It's a uh, I, I don't usually find these kind of shows relatable because they're really low hanging fruit. But the episode about the community manager <laughs> uh, got to me, which is like she said. Something along the lines of uh, being the community's mom, but also the the pillow, <laughs> the the pillow that everyone everyone screams at. Yeah, like I I forgot the quote, but for community managers, not content creators in general, because I think content creators, uh, your content kind of correct me if I'm wrong, but somehow it, it is part of your personality it's part of you mm. uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. if you're if you're aiming for authenticity you can't really detach yourself from your content creator self as easily as a uh, for instance a community manager one of my biggest like uh, if i were to go back in time and, and teach myself one thing was like really learn to disconnect uh throughout the entirety of psu 2 especially the first year I was working what felt like 24-7. I was 100% connected. Uh. Uh, I not only were... I was absorbing everything from everywhere. You know, I, I knew everything. Yeah. If you guys, if you guys thought, you know, the, the community managers don't, don't know what's going on in the community, we know everything. If, you, if you're, like, kind of a workaholic like I was at that point... Uh, you're always connected. And, uh, you know, I got calls from Japan at 2 a.m., 3 a.m. Like, I was always on. I was working uh, a lot. And disconnecting is important. So that's something I'm bringing forward, which is, like, tur- like turn, like, whatever you do for the community on, like, that's your 9 to 5. That's your, that's your work day, right? Uh, on the weekends, you disconnect on, you know, if you're not working, if you're not getting paid for that, disconnect. Um because uh, at the end of the day, I love PS2. I love whatever games I end up working on. There's no way you don't love it after you're so close and you work so hard on it. But at the end of the day, and I know I'm talking to a PS2 content creator mm-hmm. and to a community that, that watches your content, but at the end of the day, it is a game. It is a is a piece of entertainment. You know, it's fiction. Yep. Uh, and and that's something that it's as a community manager it's kind of taboo to say or to acknowledge it. Like we we always want to see the brands that we work at as larger than life. Mm. Uh, but they are a product. Is best so true? Is the fantasy star franchise going to be around twenty years from now? I don't know. Maybe it will be. Maybe it won't be. I think communities are not only volatile but they are ever changing. For sure. Um, and it might not be here, but you know, the memories will be. So if you're a player, bring, you know, why would you want your footprint on whatever, like, beautiful thing happened between 2012 and whatever, 2030, which was, a, a you know, a game that you loved, be, you know, that toxicity. So mm. uh, I know I'm, I'm going on a spiel now and just mumbling, but I think that's it. Uh it, it, it's a game. It's it's an intellectual property. Gaming communities are here. They are part of who we are. But disconnecting is also good. Um, uh, you know, molding your your personality and, and what you are on on an intellectual property is never a good idea. Mm-hmm. And that goes into you know having these uh, relationships with the people you don't even know. Some people um, take content creators as as these entities that are part of the brand and whatever happens is because they did something, they had influence, mm-hmm. you know, and man, we love content creators, but your opinion is just one among many of players. We don't weigh in, uh, if you know, uh, the opinions of a content creator versus the opinions of the, the gamers. I, I don't think I've ever heard of a studio doing that. Yeah. That's perfectly understandable. And I, I think, the best of you guys, what you do well is you distill whatever the community is, is thinking about, whatever the community is going through, and you create awesome 
you know, easily digestible content that's great for content creator for our community managers to <laughs> absorb because I watch all of you guys. Uh, I always had uh, one video or another in the background. It was you, it was Gemma, it was uh, Kami, it was Kiropi, it was King Gasma, it was all of them. Mm-hmm. Always in the background because you were kind of the voice, right, of the community. And while we collect this sentiment from everywhere, we we validated that sentiment for whatever you guys distilled. But of course, you have personal biases, so you can't just rely on your videos alone. <laughs> so yeah, that's it on the topic of what we were talking about. <laughs> Content creation. I know. Everything and a little bit of... Everything. <laughs> of it all. Uh, let, me, let me flip the table a little bit because I've been talking for most of this. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you already mentioned that uh, you, PS2 is the first game you, you played or the first community you've been involved in. Since then, have you played or tried any other games or are you still stuck with PS2? <laughs> I'll be completely honest, no. <laughs> still PS2 for life. Yeah, no, I, I, I do play some other small games here and there, but nothing like too crazy, right? I mean, the only other quote-unquote like big game that I really do play and a lot of my like followers and stuff know this but i'm actually a top 200 grandmaster in starcraft starcraft that's awesome the first one starcraft 2 okay starcraft 2 okay i i peaked i peaked a lot on the zerg ladder and actually i was actually invited to play on a tournament to play at like the asian games and stuff but i was like no i didn't want to do that that is fantastic and that was the one game i did not think would be like your your split yeah, I know. a lot a lot of people did not expect that's that. That's hilarious. But it, it's kind of just it's like the, the, that kind of like weird thing, right? Where it's like, wow. And I don't know if you talk about that a lot on your recent podcast, but what else do you do for fun when you're not content creating or illustrating or anything like that? I mean, that's really all. I mean, all my life is since I, I come from, like I said at the beginning, right, is I come from a musical family is that I generally just listen to a lot of music. I play a lot of instruments because my parents run a music school. Oh, awesome. So I, I, I kind of get to learn every single instrument and it's very fun having, you know, access to all these instruments everywhere in my house. And I'm just like, I can play anything, any way I want. And I'm just like, okay, let's do it. Just have fun with that. Do some drawings, illustrations, designs here and there. And, you know, just hang out, play games with friends and whatnot. And, you know, ever since the beginning of this month, our city is actually opening lockdown for the very first time ever since, like, the pandemic hit. Since, like, I don't know, April of 2020. So I've been spending a lot of time, like this month specifically, this month meaning October, not November, <laughs> since the month already like flipped over. But it, it, it's been really eye-opening for me personally, how much I miss these like interactions that I do have normally with my friends and family. And in retrospect, I want to say I really thank the pandemic for really giving me a big perspective on, you know, really caring about the people I care about and just spending that time with the people that you should be spending with. And it's just, it's incredible. Yeah, definitely something that a lot of people took for granted. Um, One thing that, yeah, it's funny for me too when it comes to COVID and just the pandemic in general is it's crazy how I miss the office setting sometimes. And funnily enough, the last day I stepped foot in an actual office with actual people in it was the launch day of PSO2. Really? So uh, our offices are uh, in uh, Orange County in in California. And uh, that was right at the beginning of the mandates, like the lockdowns. The, is it City of Orange? Whatever, we got a mandate to leave the offices the day of the launch. Literally the day. Oh my lord. Uh, so it was it was definitely a scrambling to to establish some remote, you know, operations and pipelines going. Uh but yeah, we actually had to leave the office uh around that time. It was it was super memorable uh because it was such a big thing for us. And yeah, I haven't seen the team. Like after the day, it was really just working remotely and trying to manage everything. 
and creating the systems that would allow us to to work and be productive working from home. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, uh, in retrospect, it's like, man, I wish I had uh, gone, you know, hanging out more with the people from work and, and doing more th- fun activities. We we went a couple of times to the like, Korean barbecue and things like that. Um, <laughs> that's a classic. That's a, also a funny story. At the time, I had the PSU Instagram on my phone. Uh, I don't know. There might be a small possibility someone that is listening to this might have stumbled upon it. So I forgot to switch to my personal profile and I actually recorded us celebrating the launch of PSO2 uh, at a Korean barbecue place because I thought it was... I actually saw that. Yeah, so that was me. And I was like, oops, uh, that was the wrong account. Uh, and I wish I had kept it because it was such a like nice moment. But I was like, I thought better of it. Uh, I don't think it would have been that bad. Uh, but we were still establishing ourselves, and I, you know, I didn't have release forms and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that was that was definitely funny. Uh, is a story. I don't think I ever shared that, but it was it was funny at the time. Um, but yeah, that, that was a great day, mm-hmm. and we were we were so happy to just bringing Peso to 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 North America at the time, but then global, like finally. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that was definitely quite the memory. If we were to say, like, if you had to, like, remember just one thing, what would be your favorite memory just, like, working with the entirety of, like, PSO2 ever since the very start? Ah, uh, wow. One only thing? What, what is the one thing that you would remember the most? I'll, I'll do two things. So one is going to be what I remember the most, which is our first kind of days in the office and kind of establishing everything there. And I don't know if you if you guys ever saw that. I mean, you probably know of it. Mm-hmm. But Piesochi used to release these gigantic, thick, like beautiful printed catalogs. Mm. Uh, these fashion catalogs for all the outfits and stuff. Yeah. I have all of them. Yeah. So we got a huge box with a bunch of the books, all the concept art, all the catalogs. And it was just setting up a display in the office with all the books and a rappy plushie and all that. And it was so nice. Oh, that's so nice. Uh, so, yeah, I just remember the feeling. I remember the smell of the books, which is <laughs> awesome. So so that was a great memory. Uh, and I think aside from that, yeah, the one that I mentioned about us having to leave the office the day we launched the game. Mm-hmm. But I think my favorite memory was really early in the in the project that we haven't launched PSO 2's Twitter yet. Though, so it was very early on. We we were working on preparing everything, you know, uh, making sure we have all the systems in place. And we had a Christmas party, uh, and everyone in the office came, and it was just so fun just seeing everyone in like a casual setting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it was just great and I, I made some uh, traditional Brazilian uh, drinks called caipirinhas and it was fun that's cool yeah. very very cool so those are my favorite memories yeah there are a lot of moments like when it comes to the context of work that I really like I really like when we announced Steam mm-hmm I thought that was huge. That was our, at the time, or whatever we did was their biggest engagement. Uh, and I loved whenever we had mind blowing news like that, just seeing the content creators uh, <laughs> reacting to it and creating videos about it. Was, was it hard? Was it hard to keep your mouth shut about NGS? Well, for, not really. The thing is, I never have the urge to leak anything or to say anything inappropriately. But because basically, I'm a by the books kind of person. I'm very neurotic about following rules. Yeah, uh, it's just part of my personality. So to me, doing something that violates that, and like saying something that, you know, um, that I w- that I was supposed to do, to me is like. It causes physical pain just the thought of it. I understand, and, and and I understand their underlying reasons why you know. I think everyone that thinks about it a little bit does like the underlying issues of of leaking something or, or of letting it leak, right? Um, because basically, you're you're really hurting the publishing and marketing efforts uh, of an entire team of people that have been working really hard and making sure the announcement came came at the right time. Yep. Uh, and and yielded the, the numbers he, he wanted to yield and it got to the most people as possible. A lot of people see 
um, marketing, publishing as, as very corporate things. But I think the people behind it, honestly, they just want the game to be seen and by as many people as possible. The worst feeling is knowing that there could be people that would have loved, absolutely loved to have played PS2 during that year, but they found out about it too late, right? So, yeah, I, I never really had that urge. of uh, I loved kind of freaking out internally whenever I found out about something. A big one for me was the Persona collaboration, Aww. just because I, I'm a huge Persona fan. Uh, so I was like... Like, holy crap, I'm actually writing about Persona right now. <laughs> How crazy is that? Yep. Uh, so I love that. Uh, but yeah, no no urge. Uh, I understand why we keep things secretive. And, and and I agree with it, you know. There's a time and place for everything. Uh, and honestly, I, I really didn't learn things uh, super far in advance. Um that was also part of our, the relationship we had with our partners from Japan. Uh, like, I really didn't know super far in advance. I knew the roadmap, right? I knew we were where our goalposts were for launching the episodes and things like that. But um, there was a lot of last minute work that I found out. Also last minute. So you'd be surprised. You'd be surprised. If anything, I feel like sometimes I found out stuff way uh after like i had to know. <laughs> i don't want to give specific examples uh and i can't but yeah that's fine that's fine but yeah i mean a new genesis was the big one i guess um that we were super excited for mm -hmm. and yeah let's see where it goes yep <laughs> anyways to wrap this up, right, Nathan, I'm going to I'm going to hit you with a uh, rapid fire questions about PSO2. Yeah, go for it. This is just like some really really nice fun short questions about PSO2. Okay. So let's see this. First, favorite class, Luster. Luster. Yes. Which style did you play? Uh the the one that was more floaty, I forgot the name. <laughs> I mean, they're they're all technically floaty, but I guess it's just either ah, red, red, green, or blue. Basically, it was the blue one, yeah. The blue I, one. I play them all. Mm -hmm. I play them all, but I like the blue one for style. The thing is, I'm not a player that likes to min max. My focus was entirely on fashion and having fun. And what looked good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and I mean having fun, but I never really pushed myself to to have the best stats or anything like that. And I know it is very bad for community manager, but I never really got a fixing, man. I, I just don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> and it it's fine. I, I, I never really understood a fixing either. It's like, mm, yeah, mm, sure, no problem. To me, that was black magic. Okay, go ahead, sir. <laughs> Next question would be, death by a thousand cuts or death by a striking blow? Striking blow. Oh, so you actually like those like big hits then? I don't know. Depends on the game. <laughs> what about a favorite episode for like the story? Uh, probably uh, episode five. And it's funny because uh, four and five have a bad rap, but I, I do love the the medieval setting and, and themes. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Favorite boss fight? I want to say I forgot all the names. Oh. <laughs> Oh my god, I forgot. <laughs> you, you can describe it. I, I I got it. The one where everyone's paralyzed and the, just the death in general. Like, you have to hit the arms. Was it Luther? Yeah, just the, the Luther fights were always great, but I have one in mind. They just uh, they all have such elaborate titles. Mm -hmm. Or was it the was it the big last one? I don't think it was the the very last one, but it was one of the one of the last ones. But honestly, I don't know. Yamato is probably the in terms of imagery is probably the one that I that I actually like liked for the context of it because it was just <laughs> quintessentially PSO2 like everything about the wackiness we love about the game in one boss <laughs> way. Yeah. Uh, and and just for for fun and games I love the terrain one too. <laughs> <laughs> but that, if that's even like, I, I guess it, to me that's like a mini boss. I don't know. It doesn't feel as overwhelming as the big bosses. Mm -hmm. It's hard. I don't know. I, I like Urgent Quest kind of equally. If they have a big big dude at the end, I don't really like the ones that are more objective-based that much. 
Oh, so you so you just prefer the big bosses than the big baddies? Yeah, I, I'm big into JRPG, so I like to see like at the end of the day, you want to fight God, right? <laughs> Isn't that the point of JRPGs? <laughs> Yeah, that's basically, you start off small, then you just like, oh, yeah. It's like, day one, I'm dying from rats. Day, you know, 360, I'm killing God, so. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, those are great. The boss battles of PS2 are so over the top and fantastic, I love them. Yep. And then now uh, this one, you're probably going to get a lot of flack for, regardless of what you answer. But to end the debate once and for all, Matoy, Hitsuki, or Harriet, who's the best waifu? Out of the three? Yeah. Man, I... I'm a Risa, dude, but I'll go for my toy then. <laughs> yeah, Risa, Risa is uh, definitely a one of a kind. I just like wacky characters uh, and, and whimsical, I guess. Mm-hmm. I guess the, the options you gave me, they're all kind of the stereotypical, I don't know. What do, what do you expect from the waifus, you know? Yeah. But yeah, actually, I don't know. Harriet, Harriet is a good character. <laughs> The only reason I give those answers is because they're the three main heroines at the end. Uh, I'll stick with Matoy. Classics, where, where, where go wrong, right? Yeah, very, very classic <laughs> one there. A, sa- a safe answer. <laughs> it's always. But yeah, Nathan, that pretty much wraps up our interview slash podcast. It was, a, it was a very fun one, actually. Awesome, yeah. I was very surprised because, like, <laughs> There was so much insight that I actually learned personally, and it, it was just uh, it was just wonderful for me personally. Thank you so much for participating. Yeah, you're welcome. It, it was great to talk about PS2 and talk to you finally. I feel like so many times as a as a community manager, I wanted to jump in and talk to you guys, and I just didn't have the opportunity. Uh, but yeah, it's mm. good to talk as a fan again. Uh, nothing I said was very like. What I couldn't say, I talked more about day to day and stuff in my own opinions. Mm -hmm. Just to reiterate so we can close it off, those are just all my opinions. They don't reflect my, you know, my past employer or anything like that. Uh, But yeah, uh, PS2 would always have a special place in my heart. And I love you guys. I hope you guys are good and have a great end of 2021. So see you later, ARCs. (laughs) And of course, the last thing is. Where do we follow you, and do you have any shout-outs? Uh, sure. Well, and also what project you're working on right now as well, also. Okay, uh, I'm working on a company called Hidden Leaf Games. Uh, yes, it is Hidden Leaf, kind of like the, the, the Konoha, the, the village in Naruto. Konoha Gakure, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, uh, it's actually a, a startup founded by a lot of folks that worked on League of Legends and Team Fight Fortress. No, Team Fight Tactics and at PUBG. Uh, I don't know, a lot of more competitive titles. We have a lot of big names mm-hmm. and they're kind of trying to break the mold of the MOBA genre and create something truly unique called Fangs uh, as a project title right now. Uh, so yeah, if you if you like the genre, uh, I, I don't know how much of an overlap there is between PS2 or MOBAs and MOBAs. But yeah, it's called Fangs. The the handle on Twitter is playfangs play, uh, at playfangs. Uh, so that's it for where I'm working at. Uh, uh, Twitter is just Nathan Ook or Nathan Nook. Uh, I go by my handle online is Nook, like Tom Nook. So yeah, <laughs> see, it's, that's the funny part, right? Because that that's what me and Cammy kind of like call you, right? Because. There's Tom Nook from Animal Crossing, and we just call you Nathan Nook. So it's like, yeah, yeah, Mr. Nook. So yeah, that's what I'm known to the current community I'm building, just as Nook. Uh, so yeah, uh, just on Twitter, Nathan Nook, but without one of the ends. So Nathan Nook is kind of merged, but that's it. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> shout out. I don't know. I, I want to shout out uh, all the content creators. I know I left a tweet there when I left PSO2, but. Um, I think every community team not only relies heavily on you guys, but uh, everything that you do is just instrumental to to fostering a good community. I don't think a small team anywhere can do that alone, right? Uh, So know your worth, um, all the PS2 content creators out there and and the players uh, in association. And I, I know every content creator has their own community, so... Yeah, just shout out to everyone who accompanied uh, our team on the journey 
and played PS2 from the very beginning. Special shout out to the closed beta testers and, and, and early adopters. And yeah, uh, it was a great time and I hope to see you guys around in uh, Halfa. <laughs> or what is the name of the new region? Retem? Retem is a new region, yeah. Halfa is the planet. Okay. Oh yeah, Halfa is the planet. Okay. So yeah, I'll, I'll be logging in for sure, at least to check it out. Uh, I hope we get kind of like a Gunblade wielding class in New Genesis. Soon. It is confirmed, but, but we, we do not know when. That is really dope, and I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> but yeah, uh, and I don't know, shout out to my wife, because she's my best friend. <laughs> oh, that's it. Oh, that's so cute. <laughs> All right, Nathan, thank you very much for your time today. And for anyone else watching, as you said, you can follow Nathan on Twitter at Nathan Nook. And then the rest of the stuff is going to be in the description below. So hope you all are doing absolutely wonderfully well. And take care of yourselves, okay? And don't forget to smile. We'll all see you very, very soon. All right. Very good. <laughs> mm-hmm.